Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. Jess and Matt are joining me. Plenty to talk about in the news this week. Uh, but first, this week, sponsored by Craft 1861, your all natural CBD products for health and wellness. If you go to their website, craft1861.com, and use promo code PLP40, you can get 40% off your order. So I will dive right in. I guess we'll start with. Ed Carpenter, who seems to be the uh, team of the week in the news in the past, I don't know, six or seven days. Last week, the rumor started that Ed Carpenter racing in 2020 would be Ed Carpenter himself. Uh, Nico Hulkenberg, which has since been uh, rebuffed by Ed Carpenter and Marinus VK, which means that Spencer Piggott has been released from Ed Carpenter going forward. So. I'll I'll leave it at that. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on kind of how the Ed Carpenter news has transpired over the last week before we continue on. Yeah, it's been a good silly season uh, nuggets that come out. And I think the Nico Hulkenberg news really caught me out of left field, especially since I think like two or three months ago, we talked about how he had said he had no ambition in, of driving an indie car. And then all of a sudden it turned to maybe just road courses only. So that was really cool rumor that lasted about a day or two, which uh, is always kind of fun to just see and track those things and see what happens. But then obviously I'm, I'm pretty devastated about the Piggott news. I'm a really big Piggott fan and I, I really like the guy and I think he's a very talented driver. So I really hope he in some capacity uh, gets a deal, which we'll touch on in a second. But yeah, uh, I don't know. Silly season's still not dead, which is really cool. I was a little shocked uh, when the, I guess, rumor um, came out with the Hulkenberg and VK uh, lineup. Obviously, that kind of all came out of left field. So a little shocked by that. Um, obviously, the Hulkenberg thing is kind of fallen to the wayside. But um, I- I'm still a little interested to see how this all plays out, I guess you could say. And then as far as Piggott, um, yeah, I mean, I, I said it on social media um, before. I just, I just don't think that he did enough to warrant another go. So I think that's not as shocking to me as uh, the rumor of who the other people were going to be. Yeah, I uh, with Jess's last point, I, I definitely agree. It was the less shocking of the two and Nika Hulkenberg that was probably the quickest end to a rumor uh, of any silly season I can remember in a while it was five days and Ed was like yeah it's not it's not happening uh so I'm glad that kind of got over with quick and uh I guess we can also pretty much assume at this point there's uh you know by the time this is released the press conference will have happened but as of the recording uh, Rinus VK told Dutch media that he would be having a press conference uh, at his sponsor's uh, headquarters in Holland uh, on Wednesday morning. So it uh, looks like Rinus VK will be taking Piggott's spot. So, you know, I have two questions here for you guys. A, you know, what do you think about, you know, Rinus VK taking the uh, number 21 car and, and do we see uh, something in the near future for Spencer Piggott? I mean, as far as VK goes, I'm a little bit surprised, I guess. I would have thought that Ed would have wanted somebody with a little bit of experience at least. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. I guess I'm just a little surprised by it. And then as far as uh, what's next for Piggott, um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't see him landing anything, especially full time for next year. Um, I I think that there's other people out there who might jump in a seat before he does. I guess to that last point, I think it'd strictly be a financial thing. 
I don't know if Piggott knew this was coming because I think as of Laguna Seca, there was some sort of handshake deal where he would be back. And obviously that didn't come to fruition. So, I mean, there's a, a bunch of talented drivers out there. I think to me, he kind of floats to the top of the list of as far as that box goes, earning a ride. But, you know, I just don't know if he's had time to collect funds from sponsors or whatnot to purchase a ride. So I, I, it's tough to see at this point. Um, if Ray Hall somehow got money together for Indy only and Hinch somehow found a ride and Daly found a ride and Piggott was like the last one left, then maybe, but it's, I don't know, it's a little gloomy right now. And then, yeah, VK, uh, you know, we've been talking about him for a lot of the off season. He's had a couple of tests with ECR and uh, Jumbo seems like a pretty good sponsor. So uh, very loyal to him and, um, that's always good. I mean, they're kind of all over the motorsport landscape, so they're definitely kind of well known around racing. So I think, uh, yeah, all good there. Hopefully, uh, they have a good year. I do think he's a really talented rookie, uh, kind of in lines with some of the other talented rookies that we've seen come up in the last couple of years. So I really think that, uh, he can do well. I'm just curious to see if he offers more to the table that Piggott did at the team because. Um, I'm still curious to see if it's a driver issue or maybe a behind the scenes issue at ECR. Yeah, very fair point there. V- VK's you know road to Indy record is is pretty stellar. He had one non top ten finish in USF 2000 and Indy Pro 2000. I know this year saying a non top ten finish in Indy Lights is pretty much a, a given, but <laughs> uh, he had one two non top five finishes this year at Indy or in Indy lights. So, uh, and obviously finished second in the, in the championship to Oliver ask you. So you know, I'm personally excited to, again. I think it's going to be an awesome rookie of the year battle. I, I guess at this point it's probably just them two for full season rookies, unless I'm missing anybody. Pato's not a rookie. So I guess that would be it. So uh, we will move on with the first fan question of the night. Yeah, actually, we've got a couple that kind of go together. So the first one is from our Patreon member, Jake Neely. Uh, He wants to know, with Penske um, taking the reins, um, is there any chance... God, I love that this is given to me. Is there any chance uh, IndyCar is going to return to Cleveland or Milwaukee? Wait, did I write the rundown? Did I do that on accident? Yep, you sure did. Okay, Surely. well, in the, fair, <laughs> in the fairness of the world, why don't you go first, Jess? Okay, well, I'm going to give that a big fat F or <laughs> <laughs> no, not going to happen. Um, I don't see it coming back to either. And uh, yeah, just no. Mike, do you want to cue up my answer on the soundboard there? He's getting a big fat F. There we go. <laughs> Um, no, unless, uh, Dan Gilbert comes out of nowhere or they make Cleveland a 500 mile race. I don't see that happening. And, uh, yeah, they can also bulldoze Milwaukee for all I care. So I don't see that happening either. I don't think Penske has any influence on that per se. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate the question, Jake, and thank you for listening week in and week out and for all of your support, but no, just, just no. That was, a, that, right. was a, that was a nice PC answer. Yes, we we all agree wholeheartedly on that one. Okay, so then also we have um, the second kind of it, similar question uh, from at Racing Results 3. And they want to know, um, what about a chance of returning to Watkins Glen? I think this has a chance. Oh, man, I don't know. I'll say it's going to happen in 2022. I feel like we need to write some of these down. Like last week I said Jack Harvey was going to be top eight in the championship. I feel like we need to start keeping track of these. So Mike said 2022 to Watkins Glen. I'll make a note in my phone here. Um, Yeah, I think it's definitely possible for sure. I don't think it's out of the realm. I think the biggest thing there is finding a date, which is, I think, the reason why it got off the schedule a couple of years ago. So uh, I'd say there's a 50% chance that it has hosted a race by 2023. 50% is pretty good. I think I'm going to go with closer to probably 40%. 
Um, I do want to see it back. I, I thought it was good. Um, but I think that there are a few hurdles and definitely the, uh, the date thing is the biggest one of them because nobody seems to be able to agree on that. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but I can at least say that there's a chance for this one. Unlike Cleveland and Milwaukee. (laughs) So moving right along then. Well, what about Fontana? Yeah, probably not that either. (laughs) Yeah. So on that note, I have nothing left to say on that topic. But uh, again, Jake, thank you. So Jake, we'll get our first Patreon shout out of the night. And we will also give a shout out to Mike Silver. And how about the Frenchman, Michael Goodyear? It was good seeing him a couple weeks ago. So uh, and thank you to everybody else. So let's continue on. So can I just point out that I am a real big fan that we all now call him the Frenchman <laughs> and it's just stuck. I even told his girlfriend we call him that and she said, that's fine. So I don't know if Michelle <laughs> listens, but uh, thank you, Michelle, for understanding. Well, what do we call Mike? Sucks at fantasy football? Oh, that's just mean. That was a low blow. <laughs> Yeah, you you pointed out to us today. You started three and one, and now you're three and eight. I didn't even know that. You probably shouldn't have told us that. Can I just point out who's leading out of the three of us? Can I counteract by say who has scored the most points in the league? I don't care. I'm still leading. <laughs> I think I did beat you in our one on one matchup too. Yeah, you did. Scoring just, the most points in the league is like leading the most laps and not winning a race. That's what I'm talking about. Says the Marco. Fantasy football participant of all of us. It starts good and then ends up sucking. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. I got stump the host tonight. It's all in love. It's all in love. I am nervous because Mike is covering his face and I haven't even asked a question yet. (laughs) Oh, I think he's worried about payback from last week. Uh, It's actually not gonna be as difficult it's it's more a silly one because it's gonna lead into our next uh kind of news topic this week so our stump the host is gonna be a couple different um factoids about robin miller i had to do some research i had to dig kind of deep for this but robin is known as being a gambler that's what he does can you guys tell me approximately how much money he says that he has lost over the years? I hate the internet. I, I literally do. <laughs> hey, it, this is supposedly straight from him. It's it's not some random made up number. So this is apparently something that he has shared at some point in time. I had never heard this before, but I found it fascinating. All right. Well, and it's enough to buy Milwaukee Mile because he probably said that at some point in a mailbag answer. So I'm going to say $5,000. I'm going to go with $125,000. It was a joke and Mike didn't get it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, what did, what's your answer, though? 125000 Good Lord. What's yours? Is yours really five thousand? Uh, no, I'll go with three hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars. All right. Well, you guys can actually split it here. It's real close to splitting it. Uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is what he claims to have lost. Uh, and also, wow, he is from here in Indiana. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. He he went to Southport High School. What else is he known for as far as his schooling here in Indiana? And this is in like all of his profiles that I'm sure he has written himself. So student council president? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Oh uh, boy. Let's see. Schooling, uh, Val Val Victorian. The exact opposite, guys. He flunked out of Ball State, and this is, and I quote, after two very enjoyable quarters. (laughs) 
So we gave Robin way too much credit on that one. You guys did. But yeah, so you guys failed miserably today, but it was fun to learn a little bit about Robin Miller, right? Uh, no, that really wasn't. And the whole gambling thing, the whole sports betting on racing isn't even legal yet. So can you just imagine once that becomes legal? Uh, well, it didn't say. I I don't think it's betting on sports i'm just saying it's just another avenue to gamble i i I think and this is just me remembering things from the past i think it's more like you know poker or slot machines or that kind of gambling not and that's been legal in indy forever so but robin will definitely gamble a lot on racing once it is legal Very likely. Um, That is actually why he ended up leaving racing because he was losing so much money, as it were, when he was driving and then doing all of his gambling. So that's why he gave up his racing career. (laughs) So there you go. Yeah, for those of you out there who took a $5 bet in 2012 on the odds that Robin Miller would eventually take credit for Joseph Newgarden ending up at Team Penske, I think you had to have won like 10 grand by now. I think the betting odds in that were probably in your favor. So we may have to come up with some other bet like that. Like what are the chances that Robin Miller takes credit for Cleveland coming back to the schedule in 17 years? It would be Milwaukee, not Cleveland. Okay. Well, we'll put $3 down on that. And if it happens in 17 years, I say, let's just give a hundred grand to somebody. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just dig deep for that one. We need to get our uh, pit lane parlay accountant on that, wherever, whoever that we just. That was me, and no. (laughs) Oh, that's not in the budget. All right. Well, we'll just stick to cheese. All right. Uh, Yeah. So as Jess segued me in perfectly, we uh, we're going to talk about Rob Miller's article that came out this week in regards to. And what he said, the thing that nobody asked for, but I'm going to say anyways, his top 10 list for things to do for IMS now that Penske took over. Uh, For those of you who can remember back to when the announcement came out, Roger Penske says that when he kind of acquires new businesses and whatnot, he makes a top 10 list for tasks that need to be accomplished. And of, I'm going to kind of briefly summarize a couple of them that Miller said on Racer Mag. Uh, free parking for practice and qualifying for all the fans that make the track down. Um, you know, rebuilding the IMS museum and kind of, as he said, further showcasing the cars rather than hiding them. Uh, improve the infrastructure of the facilities as a whole, like paving the roads to the parking lots and renovating the restrooms. And uh, probably the one that we'll probably touch on, the, well, at least I'll touch on the most here is the bringing back of the apron. So just in a general sense, what were your guys' uh, thoughts on the list that he published himself? I thought some of the ideas were actually good. I hate to have to agree with him on some things, but I thought some of them were very good. Uh, Some of them, though, did not uh, jive with me at all. Um, So I... I actually think uh, my favorite was one that you did not even mention, um, and it was the last one on his list, and that was uh, switching the BC39 to the month of May because there's already so much um, dirt racing around to kind of lead up to the 500. And then I believe he said that whoever won it would get a test day in a lights car and then get to race in the Freedom 100. I thought that was a brilliant idea maybe not uh you know unless somebody can come up with the money for that but i think just moving that race to the month of may would be a fantastic idea so i thought he had some actual good ideas this time i concur uh i liked the bc39 idea Uh, i i also agree with improving the infrastructure Uh, as jess remembers uh we got felt like we got stuck in that parking lot once it rained about every other day uh, especially the day at the morning of the race. Free parking for practice and qualifying. Yeah, I could see that. If you're going to make the trip in during the week, uh, if you don't live in downtown Indy uh, for you know practice, I, I think you deserve free parking for the day. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, and I, I know I'm not going to steal Matt's thunder here too much on this one, but I was definitely against a bringing back of the apron. No, send uh, it. Come on, let it out. Go for it. No, I, you know, it's just a bad idea. I don't think it would do anything to improve the racing. Uh, uh, I know, you know, old, you know, some of the uh, 
old, older folks out there like Robin might, you know, reminisce about the glory days of, uh, you know, was it Danny Sullivan made a pass down there or somebody, uh, but <laughs> you know, one of them. <laughs> yeah. One of those guys. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think, you know, guys are already, you know, risking a lot at, at, at Indy, you know, putting the apron, I feel like it could lead to a lot of safety concerns in the end that are, are just not worth it. And also the racing the past, uh, you know, especially the last, you know, 12 years, let's say at Indy has been by and large fantastic. Why are we going to mess with the on track product there? Yeah. I mean, that's just it. I mean, what, about the Indy 500 now makes you sit back and go, you know what? I think the racing would be a lot better if there there was an apron. Like it, it's the racing's been fine. I mean, 2018 was kind of a, a bit of a down year, but in that last decade, I think we've been extremely fortunate with some really good racing. And I think not having an apron makes it a lot more, um, almost like a knife's edge, almost because you can't. You have to time your passes very accurately and. There's really no margin for error if you don't enter the corner correctly with the apron. I feel like there's kind of more room for maneuvering and less kind of uh, sophisticated passing. I don't really have a better word for it, but some of his ideas are pretty cool. I hate the apron idea, though. I think it's also financially, I feel like that's going to be really expensive to add. So it just doesn't make sense to me. Maybe if it, if NASCAR had the premier race there, then maybe. But for the Indy 500, it makes no sense. Um uh, Oddly enough, he does talk about gambling uh, and, and his list. I forgot to mention that one. And the purse. I think uh, trying to figure out ways to make the purse larger because it doesn't seem like it's gone up the last couple of years or a couple of years, maybe the last while. Um, kind of trying to figure out ways to give teams more of a financial incentive to to enter the race, I think would help. But yeah, I think it was a, honestly like it, it, it was a good discussion starter. So, you know, props to Miller uh, got a lot of fans talking out there, but as far as, you know, we've discussed kind of his list. Is there anything that you guys would add to his list that he kind of missed? Oh, that's so hard. Give me, give me a minute to think about this. Mike, do you got one? Yeah. Uh, it might have been mentioned on the list. I didn't read it in depth, uh, so I have two minor things. He mentioned uh, paving the parking lots, which would be kind of number one for me. Uh, number two and three would be uh, better Wi-Fi, uh, and kind of I don't know. Two A would be uh, maybe a couple more bigger video screens throughout the uh, speedway. The 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 tiny ones that are kind of in the middle of the grandstands that you see if you're, you know, on pit lane or on that side are pretty much impossible to to see for people who are are sitting there. So, uh, you know, maybe one that's kind of directly in between turn one and two and three and four, something like that for the fans who don't have a good angle at those, the ones that they currently have. Uh, and then the second one would be, uh, to get a better food vendor in there, stick with their trad- traditions, you know, keep the, um, pork loin and whatever else they have going in there. Um, but they need, they, it's, it's so bad. They need to hire a new food vendor. I can, I can deal with that. I think kind of almost on the same line of thinking, um, he, they talked about renovated restrooms and that's great and everything, except for right now they don't have enough people there taking care of the restrooms that are already there. So when it's really busy, it gets disgusting if you're a female. So I would say get some more, uh, I don't know what you, groundskeeper type people that are going to take care of the infrastructure that's currently there. Uh, I like your food suggestion because yes, the food can be abysmal. Uh, One thing I forgot to point out because I was just, I just had to kind of shake my head and roll my eyes a little bit. One of Robin's uh, suggestions was basically moving everybody who has ever had anything to do with racing at all uh, back to being able to park right by the garage area. Like I, I personally am fine with where we have to park outside and walk. I mean, it's not 
miles. So <laughs> listen, that four hundred foot walk is really excessive. I, I just I saw that one and I I did. I just had to kind of shake my head a little bit because it's really not that bad. So don't let him make you think it's terrible for us. He's just whining on that one. You know what? <laughs> Some of us are just lazy Americans. Is that fair? Uh, it's fair, but it still drives me crazy. Well, I, I just like how that made his top 10 list. Like, of all things, that's the one that has to go on there. Like, really? The mechanics and the media get to park close. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, nope. <laughs> well, to counteract Mike, I was going to say removing the pork tenderloin. But I I'd, guess. I'd also getting- be okay with that. Just getting a new vendor as a whole. I would hire the person that does Road America or the people or whoever. I think everybody could get behind that. But then uh, my real answer is, is I, I know it's probably like logistically hard and whatnot, but I want to get the old infield layout that was used for the old Formula One races so that IndyCar could use it for the Grand Prix of Indy and then uh, if Formula One ever was invited back, that they could also use it. I think the biggest thing for me is using what we know as turn one as the final turn instead of having a chicane right before the front stretch. Uh, for some reason, when the Formula One cars came out of turn one going the wrong direction down the straight, I always thought that was a really cool image, and I th- thought it led to really good passing opportunities, whereas now with the chicane before that, I feel like it kind of you know neuters it a little bit. So um, that's kind of a out-of-left-field one and doesn't really have an impact on the Indy 500 at all, but it's just kind of one thing I wish they'd change. I don't really like the Grand Prix layout as is at the moment anyways. I could dig that. Yeah, totally fair. Uh, I think it is time for Jess's Joker Lab. All right, guys. Thanksgiving and the holidays are upon us. It is rather unfortunate for some people who have to think about cooking and all of that next week, and they're trying to make their list and everything else. And and they're just, you know, working their fingers off making their meals. Uh, so we are going to make a meal for our, I don't know, pit crew, our entire team. Since we have a whole team because you guys have been everything from PR people to drivers and everything in between. So we're making everyone a Thanksgiving meal. You guys are going to sit down and and have your nice little chat uh, at your meal. And you're going to have to tell everybody what you're thankful for this year. I am thankful for everybody who listens to us every single week uh, and continues to support us. So I'll start with a really nice answer while Matt can come in with the one to make everybody laugh. What? I'm not that funny. He does that every time. You know, he gives a serious answer, even though this is supposed to be fake. <laughs> I, I, just had, I just had to. Well, shout out to everybody who does listen. We are very thankful for you guys. However, I think the more appropriate answer that we are looking for is that I think we are all thankful that nobody had to see me eat 50 craft singles in one sitting this year. As Jess is like throwing up. (laughs) I just gagged a little bit. Um, Yes, I also appreciate everyone who listens uh, every week and even to our crazy um, extra episodes or whatnot. So we appreciate all of you. But that's not what this is about. This is about having a little laugh. So I am thankful for all of my terrible, terrible, Terrible flights this year. I had several of them. They made me thank God for the ground and (laughs) for my luggage. (laughs) Um, After I lost my luggage for what was that, three days or something? Yeah, that was awful. 
um, for Walmart because they have great um, $8 jeans that I can wear to the <laughs> track um, when I lose my luggage. Man, the list just goes on and on. But my my crappy flights, that, that made me um, thankful for all of the other weird things, uh, you know, that come out of crappy flights. Jess, you know what else I'm thankful for? Yeah, what? I got two. First of all, useless Danica facts. Yes. <laughs> Second of all, I really appreciate and very thankful for the fact that it always rains at Iowa every year that I go to the race. <laughs> I love rain. <laughs> really sucks. I, on, on that Iowa note, I am thankful for Matt attending multiple races this year in which all had lightning delays. <laughs> <laughs> all, all two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So can we attach a small lightning rod to his hatch or whatever? Are this you trying to kill me? No, a lightning rod disperses. Or they you meant like a metal rod. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a metal rod, but it disperses the energy. So, oh, that so you are trying to kill me. No, you are trying to kill me. No. <laughs> All right. Well, when I die, um, I don't know. What's the least <laughs> likely place to have lightning this year? Um, does, does, I don't know. Uh, is, I don't, there, is, there thunder, <laughs> is there thunderstorms in St. Pete in March? Uh, it's Florida. It rains year it, round. It rains, it rains daily. but thunderstorm. Yeah, no, it storms daily. Okay. Then I don't know. It never rains in Indianapolis in May, so I guess I won't have to worry about that. California, because, you know, they're, like, always in a drought, I feel like. All right, going to showing up to Laguna Seca with a giant metal rod on my head <laughs> in the hopes that I attract the lightning for everybody. And then my last one here uh, is thankful for multiple people who suggested that we try the Asian pizza place outside of Des Moines, Iowa, which was probably one of my favorite meals of the year. Uh, and I will be going there again this year and dragging whoever is with me to the pizza place. Uh, I can't think of the name it's of it. Fongs, but you fool. Thank you. Okay, I'm so sorry that I'm not an expert at the... I didn't even eat there and I know what it's called. Oh, well, <laughs> on that note, I will just move right on and ignore you and go into the next fan question from our award-winning author and Patreon member, Stephen King, uh, who wants to know, out of curiosity, who do we think would step away from IndyCar first? And he gave us three options. Roger Penske, Ryan hunter Ray, or Sam Schmidt. So three uh, very different you know, people in the in their jobs in IndyCar, but three very interesting options. Can I just go ahead and throw you guys for a loop? Because I like to do that one an episode. Don't say Penske. I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say Ryan hunter Ray and Sam Schmidt retired together. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. That's At the not same how that exact time. <laughs> <laughs> I just appreciate the fact that Mike booed Jeff. I feel like I'm the only one that gets booed on this show by Mike's. How can we, can we decide when Mike gets to boo himself? Can, can we make that a rule? I think I did that a couple weeks ago. Yeah, did you? you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm going to have to go with Ryan Hunter Ray. It really depends on how Spam's relationship goes this year. And if all goes well, I don't see Schmidt going for at least a couple years versus Hunter A. I think mm, this might be it for him this last year. I think he's in the last year of his contract, if I recall correctly. So this might be it for Ryan Hunter A. So I think maybe one year left and then, you know, riding off into the sunset. So I think I'll go with Hunter A. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to steal Jess's idea, the idea here and go with two. Uh, I guess it's kind of cheating, but it's kind of fun. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, Sam Schmidt and Roger Penske in a couple of years. I think Ryan Hunter Ray, yes, he's on the last year of his contract, but I think he'll have, uh, you know, maybe a, you know, maybe he doesn't want to go away. I know he's big into the family, but I think Ryan's going to stick around for more than just this year. So uh, I'm going to go with the, with the other two, just 
really because the that's the opposite of what Jess and Matt said. So I'm going to disagree with you guys for fun. What's new? <laughs> All right. So on the flip side of that question, our next fan question comes from uh, Facebook fan Danny Vaughn. He wants to know out of the following choices, who gets a ride first? Hinch, Daly, or Piggott? Hinchcliffe. Gotta go with Daly. Yeah, man. Uh, super shocked you didn't pick Piggott, uh, but I am also going to go with Daly. Doesn't have the money unless I'm missing something. So yeah, I, I think that Daly's going to throw something together and, and get his his next shot. Well, I'm hopefully I'm not. This isn't a scripted question, and hopefully I'm not stealing Mike's super duper secret host question later. But who do you guys think is going to end up in that twenty road course Ed Carpenter seat? Since we're on the topic, sorta. My my gut says I don't know. I just said Hinchcliffe, but I, I feel like this is a a prime Connor Daly spot. I'm going to go with it's going to be one that makes me go, who? It's been a while. It's been a while it since we've heard that. It's been a while. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm i going to agree with Mike and go with Daily. And... Mike, I agreed with you on something tonight. I, I see. I only, I just don't make fun of you the entire time. I promise. I do agree with you sometimes. <laughs> I got a round of applause. Wow. Um, yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think Daily is kind of like Mike said, prime and ready for that. Road course car, uh, especially with Hulkenberg kind of tanking the rumors and whatnot. So that's kind of where I leaned on with that daily choice. So we'll see, I guess. It's going to be another element to silly season that still has a conclusion. And to add on to that, I think Carpenter did say to David Malsher today that they hope to have that figured out before Thanksgiving, which now that I think about it, it's actually just next week. So that's actually not that far away. So I hope to hear something soon on that. Uh, another fan question here from uh, on this time on Facebook from Jim Kaser, and he wants to know that with the discussion last week on Simona, he wants to know who we think the next female racer that may enter IndyCar. Uh, I have two. If if Jess needs a, a moment here to ponder this one over. No, I'm going to throw one out there. It's totally left field. Uh, I'm going to say Haley Deegan. Uh, she enjoyed it. She had fun. Totally left field, but it would be fun to watch, I think. IndyCar social media would just be a a giant uh, hot mess express if that happened because the opinions on her are so all over the place. But it would be very interesting to see. I do think she's she's actually a pretty talented driver. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Jamie Chadwick, the W Series champion. If she wins again in 2020, she cannot stay in the W Series for 2021. Yeah, I don't know how much money the W Series championship really gets you. She might get a couple super license points, but uh, maybe a Indy Lights opportunity opens up for her or maybe an indy car you know road and, road and street course type position opens up for her so uh i think she's very talented and, and could fit right in my uh answer even if it may be a little unrealistic is ashley freiberg i think she's honestly up there for most talented drivers i've seen in the road to indy and more so road to indie drivers who kind of maybe not get to Indy Lights or Indy Car but end up going elsewhere. And I think she's kind of succeeded wherever she's gone. So I'm really kind of bummed that she never got to the chance to get to like Indy Lights and whatnot. And um she's honestly pretty enjoyable to follow on social media because uh she just seems like she's somebody who loves what she does and uh is always in my mind stood out as a really talented driver. <laughs> Yeah, I got one more here before uh, we move on. And I know even she isn't sure it's completely realistic at this point, but uh, I'd love to see Shea Holbrook get a chance. She was one of my favorite people I, I talked to all year this year when we when we got to interview her. So uh, she's super talented and, and would love to see her get a chance, even if it's just, you know, an Indy 500 type uh, entry. Yeah, for sure. Um 
Got another one question here. This is actually from a Reddit member. I think this might be, is this the first Reddit question we've ever had in Pit Lane Parlay? Yes. Congrats, Vitor Barreto. That's the uh, first one we've ever received, so rock on. Uh, another kind of Penske-related question here. He says, with Penske in charge, do we see more friendly international TV deals come forth and kind of help out some of our international fans who want to watch IndyCar around the world? I'm not sure about in 2020, but in the future, I, I think it's it's definitely, I shouldn't say definitely, it's a strong possibility. You know, Roger understands the business side of this and the business side of this is you know, making sure it's in front of as many people as possible, whether that be in person or on TV. So he will, uh, you know, get it in front of as many TV sets as he, as he possibly can. Yeah, gosh, I have to kind of agree with you. I don't see it happening this year. It's, it's too far into things. There's, um, you know, already contracts, um, with a lot of different, uh, people, so I just I don't think that this year it's going to happen, but I definitely think that it's something that he's going to look into and do the best thing for the business as a whole. I'm on like a 10 minute streak of being nice to Mike. Do I have to keep that going? Mm, I don't know. That's kind of a long time. I know, but I can't disagree with him or I can't. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I can't disagree with his opinion on this question. There you go. Um. Uh, Cause I think you're both right. And I do hope that it's addressed. Cause I think, uh, you know, something we didn't really touch on too much, but I think what happened in the off season with some of these international TV deals was kind of a sham, especially with Canada. So hopefully that is addressed and hopefully that creeps to the top of his list of things that maybe he can interject on and try to change a little bit. But I, yeah, it's very difficult to see that happening this year. Stranger things have happened, though. Uh, maybe we see something, especially for maybe Canada, come up in February. But um, our Canadian friends will definitely alert of alert us of that on social media because they were very vocal when the news came out last year. So hopefully they keep us in the loop if anything transpires this year. I appreciate them being vocal, though. Yes. Anywho, we've got one last fan question, and this is going to come from our Facebook fan, Josh Blackburn. He wants to know, with Penske taking over IMS, do we think that the track is going to be more open to grassroots events like Gridlife or IMSA, WEC, um, or do we feel like it's going to basically just be kind of the 500 and NASCAR or whatnot? And which way do we lean? Which do we prefer? I'm going to go with I would love to see, you know, some grassroots events uh, enter the uh, Indianapolis calendar. Uh, you know, the more you know, kind of cool events you can have there, the better if it's an IMSA race or you know, something like grid life or even the, what is it? 24 hours of lemons, uh, you know, something, you know, something like that to, to bring a different crowd to Indy and maybe have some Indy car drivers there promoting Indy car, I think would be a, a win-win. Yeah. I mean, if you asked me this question in 1991 and I was a big, um, you know, traditionalist or whatever, I would have said, nope, close it off. Don't want anything. Indy 500 only. And then obviously with the brickyard coming in 94, uh, that changed a lot of things. And now, you know, looking at how far IMS has come and what they've done over the years, I think IMS is something for everybody to enjoy, uh, regardless of what series you support. So if you're a NASCAR fan, a formula one fan, an IndyCar fan, endurance fan, a lot of the grassroots stuff that Mike just referenced, you know, the more events they can have as long as they remain of top quality and organized well and things like that, uh, I think the better because I think if you can get as many people to IMS to kind of just be in awe of the facility and enjoy what we all enjoy about it, I think the better for, you know, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as a whole. Uh, first of all, were you even born in 1991? Uh, no. <laughs> I sure wasn't. I, I just had to throw that out there because of the way you phrased all of that when you started. <laughs> I said if. I did say if. 
You said if this was 1991, I would blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. I guess if I was alive in 1991. There you go. Better. There you go. Okay. Sorry. I had to I had to make fun of you a little bit. Hey, I'm old now, remember? I know what a Rolodex is. I you do. That that is true. Okay, so anyways, back to the the actual question. <laughs> um Yeah, so being here pretty much my whole life minus last year. Um, there are a lot of events that happen at IMS that don't really get any publicity already. Um, and they're pretty much all grassroots type stuff. There's, you know, go-kart race. There is a uh, Corvette club. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of different races that happen there. Um, so, I don't know that I can say I want to see a whole bunch more, but I want them to keep doing what they're doing. I don't want them to eliminate um, these off weekend events. Um, I say off weekend as in no big NASCAR IndyCar event is happening Um, because obviously you have all heard my opinion on dirt racing and everything else. And, and that's, you know, where I feel like there's so much heart in it. So I definitely want them to keep some grassroots stuff going. Um, I would love to see more, but as long as they keep up what they're doing currently, I'm going to be a happy camper. Yeah, I think that's uh, very well said there. Uh, And it is time for the super duper secret host question. And this news uh, article is actually a couple weeks old. I think we we talked about it a little bit on social media. I don't think we talked about it in an actual episode. If I did, well, we're going to talk about it again. So the Road to Indy mandated the cockpit protection device for the 2020 season. The little uh, the AFP device on the that was on the front of the Indy cars this year. So. Uh, you know, with that, I, I'm curious to see, you know, if you guys think that's a good first step, should they have gone in, you know, with the arrow screen as well? I'm sure that's probably a bit too much of a cost, but, uh, how do you see the road to Indy, uh, safety, uh, innovations kind of mirror off of Indy cars? I think it's a good start, kind of like we thought it was a good start this season when they implemented the AFP. Um, I, I think that they could have probably done a little bit more, but again, cost wise, it's, it gets to be extreme. And I think they, I think they're doing the right thing, honestly, by kind of rolling things out slowly. Um, Not, they're not super slow. I mean, we're only, you know, a season behind roughly. Um, but I, I think it gives teams time, a little more time to adjust, um, to the cost of, of these devices. And I, I think it's a a positive for them. Yeah, I agree. I think it's kind of a tall task to test and implement the, you know, Red Bull screen that we're seeing in IndyCar to the cars before the start of the season, because they do have to figure out you know, how to keep the drivers cool. And if what Pato was saying at the last test, if you're not going fast, that may not work that well. Well, for those F2000 cars, I know, you know, obviously they're pretty darn quick, but they're nowhere near as fast as an Indy car. So that may pose a problem itself. So I uh, don't mind the AFP. I think it should at least hopefully help with anything like a tire, but um Hopefully, in a couple of years, they figure out a way to get the a version of the Red Bull screen on those all those road indie cars. Yeah, I'm sure that's probably already being discussed behind the scenes. And I agree. I'm glad they they kind of uh, you know took that first step. I didn't really know what they were going to do going into the off season, how they were going to approach safety. So I'm glad they uh, are taking the initiative to to step up and you know, take that first step. And I'm sure, you know, within a year or two, we might see the error screen. I'm sure they won't rush that uh, Mm -hmm. since it's, it is a pretty big investment for some of these, you know, lower level teams that, uh, you know, are just a USF 2000 team or just Indy pro. 
but with that, we will go into the pitfalls momentarily. Uh, again, this week brought to you by our friends at gripmat.com, G R Y P M A T.com, the world's first flexible non slip tool mat that makes a great holiday gift. Use promo code PLP10 for 10% off your order. And now it's time for Pit Lane Parlay's Pitfalls of the Week. So with that being said, I'm going to start it out this week and I'm going to pitfall the NASCAR playoff system that was supposed to solve the issue of winless seasons winning the championship. Uh you know, okay, so Kyle Bush did win this year, so you know he he is safe from this pitfall. But Matt Crafton in the Truck Series has not won a race since 2017. Did not win the championship race in Homestead this weekend, and won the championship. It just just seems kind of deflate. I know you know the argument is, you know, uh, consistency over wins is the best thing, but your championship driver didn't win a single race all year. And I think he only finished top five, maybe a handful of times all year. I'm going to look that up while you guys uh, give me any sort of input here on, on what you think of this. Yeah. If I were a huge NASCAR fan, uh, which we all know I'm, I'm not. So I, I can't really have a super, super opinion on this, but I would be very disappointed um, as a, a fan of the series to have something like that happen. I, I think it would be a giant letdown, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Didn't Ryan Newman almost do the same thing like two years ago in the Big Boy series? Uh, yeah. And I think Austin Dillon accomplished it in the Xfinity series in t- all, two or three years ago as well. Uh, but to follow up with my point he had a second place in homestead a second place in texas and a third place in las vegas uh and a handful of top fives otherwise you know nothing really to to write home about and in the in the truck series so i mean listen i'm glad he you know had a consistent season especially in the playoffs and i don't know really know all that much about matt crafton but doesn't seem like anybody really hates him for anything. So he must be a stand up guy. He's not flicking people's hats off uh, like half the NASCAR paddock is. So, uh, yeah, we will move on to Jess. I've got a pitfall a whole lot of people this week, and I am including myself and both of you all in this one. Because we all deserve it, because this is going to be a terrible off season. We're going to have nothing to talk about. And what has happened this off season? I mean, I still can't like close my Twitter out without some crazy announcement, like blowing up Twitter and knocking my socks off. Um, so I, I have to. Pitfall, everyone who has said that the IndyCar offseason was going to suck this year. Yeah, Robin Miller. And us. <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't some guy buy the IndyCar a couple of weeks ago? Well, buy yeah. the IndyCar? He bought the IndyCar. He bought the Indy Motor Speedway. He, he bought a lot of things. I'm going to pitfall myself for stumbling over my words. Uh, <laughs> Not to laugh at my uh, laugh at what I was about to say, yeah. Uh, we all got this one very wrong. You know, I you know, kind of got an inkling back in the summer that we might see a few things, but obviously, a few things has turned into uh, every week. There has been something you know pretty massive to talk about. So, uh, thank you to IndyCar for giving us plenty to talk about this off season. I thought you were about to say thank you, IndyCar, for being bought. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a uh, weird. Okay. <laughs> well, we can send him a we should send him a nice little chocolate basket. Like, thank you, IndyCar, for being purchased. So we have something to talk about. Uh 
No, yeah, honestly, though, like Robin Miller is kind of the first one to come out like, yeah, people, this isn't really going to be that fun because if Rossi doesn't change seats and nothing's going to happen. So I guess we kind of all bought into that hook, line, and sinker. So joke's on us, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, mine's a Formula One topic. And uh, I don't know, Mike, have you seen my pitfall yet? Did you look at it in the rundown? I, I see who it is. I uh, Are you shocked? Did not wa- no. No, I'm not shocked. I did not watch the race this weekend. I hear it was great, but uh, I, I just, I honestly have no excuse. I was sleeping on the couch all afternoon on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, so if if I were to say it to you all at home that mine was Formula One related, I'd hope you'd all make the connection to realize that it's uh, about Sebastian Vettel because I feel like half or two thirds of my Formula One related pitfalls are either about Ferrari or Sebastian Vettel. And uh, the big thing that he did at the race on Sunday, in which I still think he's starting to get to the point where I would fire him. I know he's not going to get fired, but I'd still fire him. Um, He got past his teammate, Charles Leclerc, down the straightaway and kind of moved over on him, uh, basically ending both their races after contact was made. And I'm watching the replay, and I honestly, for the life of me, cannot figure out what he was thinking in that situation. He was going to, I mean, they were about halfway down the straight. I think he was, you know, going to clear him easily with DRS by the time they got to the turn that he didn't even have to worry about a counterattack from Leclerc. And, you know, I think it also got to the point where I think hopefully if Leclerc was being smart, he wouldn't have forced the issue into that turn if he did have some sort of window. But he would have been pretty far behind Vettel. So I just honestly, I don't understand what Vettel's thinking, especially against his teammate. And I think someone pointed out several months ago that, you know, you kind of see some drivers who are very successful towards what could perceive to be the end of their career start to make these uncharacteristic mistakes and nobody figures, you know, nobody knows why. And I think one of the main ones that we can look back on was Michael Schumacher started making some pretty uncharacteristic mistakes towards the end of his career as well. So it's honestly, somebody needs to wake up at Ferrari and figure out that, this guy's not helping your team any, not winning races. Leclerc's been kind of as a whole faster than him, and Leclerc's made far fewer mistakes, and it's only Leclerc's second year. So I'm over Vettel. I think it's time for him to be fired, if I'm being honest. I would have never guessed you didn't like Sebastian Vettel before today. What? That's uh, That being said, shocking. I didn't. I didn't see the incident. Uh, I took uh, a lazy weekend this weekend for a change. So uh, I don't have too much to say based on what you said. Yeah, I'd probably pitfall him too. I don't know if Jess wants to add anything uh, to this. Yeah, I didn't see any of this. I was at Disney World walking 30 miles, literally. Uh, so I I didn't log back into social media until today. I had no idea any of this went on. And... Uh, yeah, we did all know you didn't like that, although. So, I did, I, I'm shocked. <laughs> I tell you, I, I am. What would give you that inkling that I do not like Sebastian Vettel? I don't know. Just a guess. Just, just a weird feeling. Well, on that note, I we will. Uh, I guess we're we're at the end of the episode here. So again, thank you everybody for tuning in. I uh, hope you enjoyed this week's uh, Trenton Speedway. Uh, Lost Tracks episode with uh, our pal Frank Santoroski. Frank is a great resource for uh, some of these historical tracks, and we'll be sure to do a few more of these throughout the off season. So with that being said, Jess, go ahead and sign us off. And guys, keep your lug nuts tight.